Okay, so we've made it to another video. I've not lost you yet, hopefully. And we've talked about the auto injector. And we said the auto injector is going to inject my sample. And that sample is going to go through an eight point valve. And that eight point valve is going to rotate and it's going to suck up sample and then it will suck up some acid and it will suck up some water if needed. And then it will mix everything and put it into the syringe. And that's what we talked about in the last video. So here I'm in my syringe area and it's bubbled and all of my purgeables have left and I've bubbled it for a certain amount of time and then that syringe is going to inject it onto the next step of the instrument. And the next step here is my combustion tube. So I'm going to draw combustion, right? So we've talked about combustion already. We've mentioned the reaction and we said I've got some kind of organic compound and I'm going to react O2 with it and I'm going to get CO2 and I'm going to get water every single time. It doesn't matter what type of organic. That's the way this thing works. I keep saying it over and over and over and over and over. All right. So this is where what I call the magic happens. This combustion tube is going to be very important because this is what's going to convert my organic material into carbon dioxide. And it's the carbon dioxide that the machine will measure. So if my combustion tube is not operating the proper way, I'm not going to get CO2 or the proper amount. And if I don't get the proper amount of CO2, then my data is going to be faulty. So out of everything here, everything's important, but out of everything here, this is what's going to drive the production of the CO2 for me. So it's very important that I make sure that this is working the proper way. So the combustion tube is going to be a very important piece of my machine. It's also something that could be quite costly if you are not careful. So this is where my sample is combusted. Now, we talked about the combustion process, and we said that O2 is needed, right? So I know that airflow probably is going to happen in this combustion tube area. I know that it's going to come around because that's my O2 source. And we also said that combustion is going to require this triangle, and the triangle is representative of heat, and this thing does have to be heated. And it's going to be heated in a furnace. So this is a very well insulated furnace or box that my combustion tube is going to sit inside of. And that furnace or that oven is how I want you to think about this is going to be heated up to 680 degrees. That's super hot folks, right? Water boils at 100 this is almost seven times hotter than boiling water. This is the temperature that's going to be required in order to get this reaction to go forward in a certain amount of time so we don't have to sit here and wait forever for a sample to get processed. It's also going to include a metal catalyst. And that metal catalyst we'll talk about in just a second. But heat is going to be a requirement here. And it's something that the instrument will always monitor and measure. Because if this instrument cannot get to 680 degrees, then an error code is going to come back. And it's going to say, your furnace is malfunctioning. There's a problem. Just like the oven at your house. If you set it at 375 and it never can get to 375, then there's something wrong with the heating element, right? Or you set it at 375 and let's say that it just keeps on a heating and it just keeps heating up and up and up and up and up and it never cuts itself off. The regulation's gone bad. The same thing can happen with a TOC furnace, right? Same kind of problems. If that begins to happen, your software and your instrument will tell you that. So number one thing is the heat. That has to stabilize. It has to get to 680 and it has to stay constant, right? Number two, air intake has to happen. If air intake does not happen in this area, then nothing is going to get combusted because O2 is going to be a requirement for this reaction. So that's also going to be another problem area. 
If your air runs out, that's kind of what drives this forward. If the air runs out, no product is going to happen. No product's going to happen. Your detector's not going to see anything at all. So CO2, this is where the magic happens. If I go back to this flow diagram, kind of just track it. So I see my sample getting sucked up into the eight-point valve. Some acid or some water added in if needed. It goes into the syringe. That syringe is going to get bubble, 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 bubble. And then it goes back up into the eight-point valve. The eight-point valve is going to turn, and it's going to open up a spot that will lead into the combustion tube. Right? We talked about that valve. We talked about that Teflon basically turning and opening up certain doors. The door it's going to open up now is the door that leads to the combustion tube. Well, this is just so happens to be spot number six. All right. Is that necessarily important? Not really. But if I look on my valve, I'm going to see numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And on my Shimatsu system, number six is going to lead to the combustion tube. They are clearly labeled and identified so you know what tubing line goes where. So my sample is going to go through tubing number six, and it's going to slowly get pushed in to my combustion tube, which is over here. These big boxes over to the side, that represents the furnace. This is an enclosed area that's going to be heated up. Again, there's going to be some insulation on it so it can stabilize that temperature out. And my sample is going to be squirted into this combustion tube. And this is where my combustion reaction will happen. And that combustion reaction is going to generate CO2. So this is the area now in the schematic that we're going to be talking about. It's that area there. Now, do you have access to that area? And the answer is yes, kind of, right? So this is the top of the TOC instrument. When I open the door up, uh, this knob right here on the front that's going to be pointed toward me, and this is a lid that goes onto the top of the TOC instrument. And that lid can just open up, right? Uh, this screw tightens it down, so I'll just loosen that up, and this lid will just flop open. That's all that there is to it, so I'll, it's on hinges. So I just lift it up, and now I have access to the top. Well, my combustion tube is kind of down in here, right? Down here at the very bottom. And this stuff is sitting on top of the combustion tube. And I need access to that combustion tube. So I'm going to have to take some of these pieces and parts off so that way I have access to the actual tube itself. Okay, so one of the things that has to happen are these screws. These screws are going to have to be loosened up a little bit. So that screw will loosen up and it will allow you to slide this top Teflon piece off. That Teflon piece slides back and forth and it allows your sample to go into the combustion tube. That's its purpose and that's what it does. You can see the line that follows it here. That line is coming from your eight-point valve. So the eight-point valve opens up. It allows your sample to be squirted through the tubing and it comes into the injector or the combustion tube right here from the side. So this piece will slide back and forth and it closes that off and it opens that up to your sample. So just another different type of mechanism to give you access to where it needs to go. So that piece is just slid off. That's all there is to it. One screw, pretty much, that's it. Uh, and you can just kind of rest that over to the side and you're getting closer to the combustion tube now. Uh, the next thing that you would probably want to do is go down to the bottom of the instrument. Again, this is the front facing and this is the door open. And down here at the bottom, you're going to see, again, some more kind of Teflon looking pieces. And those pieces are going to be attached to the bottom of the combustion tube. And the bottom of the combustion tube is right there. Normally, it would sit all the way down in here. All right. So this image is actually you loosening it up already. And you're beginning to pull out the combustion tube from the top. So normally, that sits into that seat. And it just kind of clamps down in place. But 
you would want to loosen that up a little bit so that way you don't snap and crack the bottom of that combustion tube. It's very important, right? No cracks uh, can be in that glass or you're going to lose stuff. So this combustion tube uh, I, here, they've showed um, pulling off this line to the side and this just basically lifts up. All right, that's all that there is to it. The whole thing will lift up in uh, total and then you can see the combustion tube come out of, of the furnace. Inside of the combustion tube you see this kind of gray stuff. All right so this gray stuff is the catalyst. Remember I said there's a metal that's involved and it has to be heated. So this is the metal catalyst that's on the inside of these. Uh, we call it the catalyst beads. If you call up Shimatsu and you say, hey, I need some new catalyst or I need some new catalyst beads, they know exactly what you're talking about and they'll ship you the proper ones for your instrument. They can come in different forms and in different varieties, but this is what the standard catalyst bead looks like. They're just little round gray BBs, basically, that go on the inside of this tube. Uh, this catalyst is an alumina, A-L-U-M-I-N-A. It's an alumina bead, and that alumina bead is going to be pretty important because this bead is going to be coated in platinum, probably one of the most expensive things off the periodic table. Okay, That is going to be a problem. These are platinum catalyst beads here. Now, those beads are not pure platinum. If so, then this would be probably so expensive that nobody could afford it. But this is an alumina bead, and the alumina bead is going to have a coated surface, and that coated surface is platinum. That is the metal catalyst that's going to be required for this process to work. All right? So there's a lot of things that go he on here with the combustion tube. So first, let me clear this out. You could have to replace the combustion tube. Maybe over time this has gotten damaged. Maybe you've had it for a handful of years and you just feel better about putting a new one in. Maybe over a course of time the inside of it has just gotten so crudded up and contaminated that you're having some crossover and you want it a little bit cleaner. So you're either going to have to replace it or you're going to have to clean it and then put the old one back in. Well, this is one of the reasons that you would need access to here. All right. The second thing that can go on are the beads. Over time, those things will start to decompose. And you might have to replace those beads as well. So you'll have to call Shimatsu up and you'll have to say, I need some more catalyst beads. They'll ship you some new ones and you will dump the old ones out and you'll put the new ones in. A couple of different reasons you need access to this combustion tube, all right? And that's why we're talking about it, and that's why we're covering it. As far as the alumina goes, alumina is AL203. You're going to hear a lot about alumina and silica a little bit later on in our instrumentation courses. So I'm not going to dabble into it too much here, but I just want you to understand that that is the majority of the bead. All right, That BB ball, or sphere, is mainly AL203. And then on the surface only of that bead, we have a coating. And that coating is going to be platinum. So AL203 is the foundation of the house. And the platinum is everything that's kind of built on top of that. So that's what you're seeing here in this picture. It is the alumina spheres with the platinum surface. So the combustion tube could need replacing and the beads could also need replacing. Uh, if you have to replace the tube, you take the old one out, you dump everything out of it. You throw the tube away. And then you have ordered probably a new tube. And that new tube just basically gets inserted where the old one came out of. And you put the top piece back on. And you screw it all back together. Very simple. Very easy process again. You just slide the old one out. 
slide the new one in, and then you put it back the way that you took it apart. One screw at the top, one screw at the side, one screw at the bottom. That's it. If you have to replace the tube, you're looking at around 225 bucks. So, not cheap, but it's not the most expensive piece that we've seen so far. That was the syringe. Over time, things that I want to say about the tube, it will get cloudy, and that's okay. It's not going to stay clear. It's not going to stay pristine and pretty. Over time, as you use it, that combustion tube will get a white, crusty residue on the inside. That is normal. Even with an instrument that has no problems, that combustion tube could have that residue around the outside. It's not really causing you any problems. It's just residual stuff from the surface or the coating of the beads. It, that's just the way it's going to be, folks. You're heating this up to 680 degrees. You are using it over a course of time. Aluminum is going on the inside of it that's coated with this platinum. So there's going to be some residue that's going to stay behind. And that's normal. That's okay. So if you pull out the tube and your intentions are just to replace the beads and you see this kind of wattish stuff that's coated on the inside of that tube, that is perfectly fine. That is not a big deal. That is normal. You're going to see that. If it makes you feel better, you can clean it. How do you clean it? You use some hydrochloric acid, right? So you're going to use some dilute, preferably, hydrochloric acid. You just kind of pour it into the combustion tube, let it sit, give it a good rinse or two rinses, make sure that all that acid is out of there, and then away you go. It's not necessarily going to take off the white crusty crud stuff, but you've at least gave it a good cleaning. So that white-ish residue will always stay behind, all right? If it's a used tube, it's going to be there. There's nothing you can do about it, whatever. We move on. There's other things to worry about in the lab besides that tube, okay? So if you have to replace the combustion tube, go for it. 225 bucks. it might make you feel better if it's not cracked or damaged just to have a new one that's on the inside. But keep in mind, these things can be cloudy. It's not a sign of an issue or nothing. Another thing that can go on here when you change out the tube are the O-rings. You know, the O-rings really give it a good seal. And if these O-rings go bad, they could dry rot or they could get crusty or flaky. It's going to allow leaks to happen. And you don't want that. Everything has to be kind of tight and everything has to be kind of self-contained. You cannot have... Um, leaks out of the system. You cannot have areas where maybe residual air from the environments coming inside. Everything has to be a super tight fit. So this O-ring, one of them, is up here at the very top. So this washer comes off and it gives you access to that O-ring. You can take a pair of tweezers and just pop that sucker out and put a new O-ring on uh, in place of it. Uh, those O-rings are not expensive. They tell you to do them every so often, whether it needs it or not, just to ensure that everything is keeping a tight fit. Uh, to you, it might look pretty good, but to the machine, it might be a little old and it might be leaking and you just don't know about it. The reason that they tell you to do it is because those O-rings are not expensive at all. We're looking at $18 for a pack of five. And that's it. So O-rings, very reasonable. So if you're going to go through the trouble of taking the slaughter piece off and getting access up underneath here, you might as well go through the step of just popping that off out of there and putting a new O-ring on instead. It keeps your system clean. It keeps the system happy, right? That's not the only O-ring, though. The other O-ring is on the bottom of that attachment. So this is the bottom, okay? My tube would actually set up in here. So this is turned upside down on you, right? This is the stem that they loosened over to the right-hand side. And this is a piece of tubing that went off that we told you to unscrew. Well, this is the bottom. So my combustion tube will slide up in there, the top of it, and it will stay in there. And it doesn't screw in there. It's a piece of glass. 
So this rubber O-ring actually holds that in place. And over time, again, that O-ring could lose its elasticity, it could begin to dry rot, and it might not hold your combustion tube up in there and seat it the proper way. So you would need to pop that out and you would need to replace that O-ring as well. Again, you just take a pair of tweezers, that tweezer and that O-ring will pop right out of there for you, and you just put the new O-ring in and seat it back in place where it needs to go. Then the top of that tube will basically sit down uh, or go up into that seat, and then you just screw everything back together again. So once more, I got a video of just kind of some still images for you, uh, so that way you can kind of see these things in motion about the combustion tube and about these O-rings as well. All right, so here's the top of the machine, and we're just going to loosen that screw and open up the lid. There you have access to the top slider piece. We're unscrewing those pieces so we can flip this off, or maybe slide it out is a better term. We don't want to flip things off, right? If it gives you problems, you probably do want to flip it off. And then down here at the very bottom, we're loosening that as well, and this entire combustion tube is going to get pulled up and out of the machine. And there you go. You can see the catalyst beads and everything else. A new system will probably come into play. There we go. And then it seats back down into the furnace. You'll want to re-tighten this bottom piece as well. Make sure that's secure. And then at the top, you reattach the plastic tubing. You see it threaded on. And we put the slider back on. And we put the screw that holds the slider in place. So that is the way that you change out the combustion tube on the inside of the TOC. Again, a couple of screws. That's it. One at the top, one at the side, one at the bottom. And the whole entire assembly comes out, and then it comes back together as a whole. Uh, something else that I want to maybe uh, tell you about. You probably saw it in one of the pictures. See this big image of a triangle right here? There's a thicker piece of tubing that leads from the top. This thicker piece of tubing that has this tag on it that says, Caution! and it comes out the front and over to the side, that is a drain tube. So this will eventually go into a drainage tube, so any extra that should not be injected into the machine, that will leave the drain tube through that route, uh, and that will drain out of the machine before you begin to use it again. So in this video, you're going to see the replacement of the O-rings, and again, the screw gets unthreaded uh, out, the top opens up. You're going to take the slider piece back off with that one screw. It just slides out of there. That's all it does. And you have access to now this rubber O-ring at the top. So take a pair of tweezers, dig it down in there, get the O-ring out, put the new O-ring inside. That creates a better seal for you, brand new, nice and tight. And then everything just gets slid back on once more. All right, that's all that you have to do if you have access to the top part of the TOC instrument. And there you go. Nice and tidy. So now that we've talked about the combustion tube, what I want to do in the next video is talk about the catalyst into more detail. So the beads that are on the inside of the combustion tube. I want to expand on that a little bit more, talk about maybe why we have to replace those and when we know we have to replace them and uh, how much they cost uh, and those types of things. So in the next video, we're going to focus on those beads on the inside of the combustion tube, and we'll still be talking about that general area of the schematic. So again, we're talking about the furnace area here, and we talked about the tube now. That can be dirty over time. It's quite normal. But now we're going to focus on the beads that go inside of that tube. So we're still going to be focused in that general area of the schematic when we come back.